Um, using artificial intelligence may impact, you know, some jobs, but overall it may uh, shift them to more managerial roles or have uh, for maybe a better impact on cost or uh, your consumer's interest. Uh, so embracing a little bit of uh, the impact that's going to happen across the board globally with, with, with digitalization and AI. Welcome to Uptech Report. This is our Applied Tech series. Uptech Report is sponsored by TerraLeap. Learn how to leverage the power of video at TerraLeap.io. Today, I'm excited to be joined by my guest, Brianna Lynn, who's based in Austin, Texas. She's the founder and CEO at Journey Foods. Welcome, Brianna. Good to have you on. Hey, Alex. It's so great to be here. Uh, I've been looking forward to speaking to you for, for quite some time here. Yes, I'm excited <laughs> for us to be able to chat today. Help me understand, Journey Foods is focused on as a food science and supply chain software. Where are you guys really focused on, on serving? What industry and what problem did you see in that industry that you then set out to solve? Yes, absolutely. So I've been a serial entrepreneur in the food industry for about a decade now. Uh, through experiences that, that I would love to dive into, really found that a lot of the lack of change within the industry is due to the R&D and supply chain management. Uh, and so we work directly within the middle of the value chain for food companies, like after sourcing and sort of before they get to consumers to really make sure that uh, the processes, the R&D, the innovation, the data that's necessary to make better food products, which um, at Journey Foods, we focus on packaged and processed food products. That's 70 percent of what we consume every day. Uh, most of what you see in the grocery aisles, uh, we really dive in on. Uh, helping not only R&D teams, but procurement teams, product managers, marketing managers, collect the data that's necessary to make products more nutritious, more sustainable, and more cost-effective, not only for the businesses, but for, for their end consumers. You had already given um, note there that you're not new to this industry. I mean, you've been in the food and beverage industry for a while. One of the previous company, companies, Food Trace, you were already helping in that sphere uh, on better food sourcing. Did I get that right? Yeah. So, so making sure that we had more transparent supply chains um, going to our restaurants, going to our offices, and many other places. Uh, yeah. You know, it was a, it was a problem that we faced um, at one of my first food companies. Uh, where I launched a uh, chain of juice bars and production facilities with a family member. And we were right in the middle of Chicago. Uh, we wanted to bring more nutrient dense, more organic foods to the Chicago market. Uh, but our team had a lot of troubles with uh, the transparency, understanding the management inventory. Uh, and that was like an internal project that I spun out for a few food companies, including my own, uh, into turning me into food trace and I've gotten wonderful experience, both investing, scaling, and even on the tech side at Google uh, within the food industry and super, super excited now to bring a lot of these learnings together into Journey Foods. It's almost like a, all the learnings are coming over time to say, all right, this, this is the next venture. It naturally led to where you are here. So let's dig a little bit further into the Journey Foods. What, what does it look like then it, for, for a company to be able to use it? What is the, the tech stack and what's the, the use case for it? Yeah, so um, we sort of combine product management software uh, alongside uh, a lot of data that's that's really uh, sort of funneled into this uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence process, uh, where we essentially take uh, the decision pathways of a food scientist uh, and look at the preferences of a company. Let's say, for example, they want to make a bar uh, less... Uh, more nutrient dense have but also at the same time focus on the needs of consumers today which is uh, I want something with less uh, toxic sugars and I want products that have ingredients that are more sustainable maybe even around the same price uh, we look at that product category we sift down you know uh, hundreds of thousands of ingredients into a filter we then look and make sure and compare these alternatives uh, to, to the preferences of the company uh, and then find action plans for them so that they don't have to go through multiple iterations and trials 
over many months, you know, the traditional process takes anywhere from 12 to, to 18 months. Um, it's getting a little bit faster in ways, but still not fast enough. Also, there's a tremendous amount of waste um, in, in the supply chain when it comes to the types of ingredients we're choosing now, because we just don't have that, that much smarts here in the industry. If we think about it, um, historically, we're not that far away from uh, families turning from self-sustaining sort of gardening families where they were growing their own fruits and vegetables and, you know, maybe had local uh, meat distributors to uh, grocery stores sort of launching in the 1940s. And so we've tried to keep up uh, as scientists, as uh, logistics companies, and, and now more recently with software and data um, with ever-growing population needs. And um, you can imagine that we weren't really able in the past 70 years to sort of transition, uh, you know, human evolution of agriculture over the past 10,000 years to what we do now. Uh, and so there's been a quite a bit of um, degradation, not, not only to the environment, but to our bodies to keep up with uh, shifting human needs to more convenience foods. Uh, and so at Journey Foods, we are really supporting companies and finding those gaps so that we can uh, sort of reverse those effects. So, so it's it's a mix of multiple of both. It seems like a personal mission of of, of desire for for foods to get better <laughs> ingredients or the, the the right direction for us as humanity needs to go. But at building them faster and more efficiently and getting like all the knowledge and data in one place. You mentioned early on a, as a, a food scientist that effectively you have all the inputs of your data of all the different ingredients or, or what you could build something with. And that's kind of where your dashboard or your uh, platform allows them to build both of what's available uh, and also what is supply chain wise. Is, is that like both of the, the components? Yeah, you know, so just like traditionally now today, um, you know, many companies sort of get brokers or they find new ideas trending and they try to turn that ingredient on social media into sort of a a, you know, scalable option, whether it be a fast growing company on Shopify or, uh, you know, some of the world's biggest food companies. You asked about our stack. We're uh, Google Cloud, GCP, um, Mongo, TensorFlow, um, Python, React.js, you know, sort of, you know, some of the more popular stacks with the several sort of, uh, solutions that help support our artificial intelligence. But, um, we are also need to make sure that we find products and ingredients and alternatives at scale, right? So uh, the reason why we're not just a food innovation R&D uh, platform is that uh, lots of companies want to implement new ideas or changes really rapidly. But at the end of the day, the supply chain and cost is really important. Uh, to all decisions. And so we have to do the hard work of connecting software, whether it be Shopify or SAP or Microsoft Dynamics or some of the other supply chain solutions so that we can get the right data so that a decision to switch to a, a gluten-free uh, flour alternative won't necessarily wipe out, um, you know, half of Canada's you know, crop for, for the year. So uh, this really affects not only sustainability, but also costs. And so uh, looking forward and backward in the supply chain is really helpful to, to these sprints and to, to making larger change. How does this, uh, this data integration work? It sounds like you, you focus heavily on the integration side to be able to get this data in. How did you build that and how does that work? Absolutely. You know, so we take really a lot of inspiration from fintech, uh, from a lot of fintech growth and digitization over the past few years. You know, um, B2B growth has been quite strong with companies uh, like Plaid. Uh, you know, integrations are very key to adoption and also uh, consumer uh, or customer uh, acquisition and stickiness. And so we wanted to make sure that, um, you know, honestly, we could compete with the future of like where the food industry and where software, B2B software is going. Um, but we saw a unique opportunity to one, drive about 40% of our revenue from integrations uh, to bring on larger companies because of these integrations to their existing solutions. And then finally, um, there's a lot of data that we have to crunch. And this is a, a easier way for us to collect more data, you know, our goal as a company, um, you know, we're 
a smart team of food scientists, data scientists, and many other great thinkers uh, is to build one of those most actionable food databases uh, in the world. And we cannot do that without connecting to real supply chains as well. And is this, if someone wants to be able to start using, is it already exists there? Like the data you just, you've already done all the hard work or are they needing to still make connections into the, into your platform? Yeah. So we have sort of three ways to go about it. You can use our database para, which is growing, living dynamic database that we're adding to every single day. Uh, para actually means guava. Uh, and, and, um, you know, several East African languages, and we were just really inspired by the the the, the role of the tongue, but um, also, uh, you know, inspired by my, the fact that for me, I really think that there's an abundance of great learnings that we can bring from the continent of Africa when it comes to our agriculture, and how can we infuse that a little bit more into our you know, into the food, the food industry. Uh -huh. And then we have sort of our customer's data that's typically built upon sub, uh, supply chain integrations. Uh, and then finally, uh, you can enter it manually, which is a pain. Uh, but we do have Google Sheets and CSV integrations and other things that are pretty simple. Yeah, so you, you still have the standard ways one could could get that data in, but you're, you're, you've got your base data that they're welcome that they can use Then you have the ability for some integrations or, or to bring it in. But I, I, coming back to your, it sounds like your, your personal mission of, of just kind of revolutionizing the, the food industry of, of how foods are created and made. Um, have you just always been this passionate about the, the, the food <laughs> industry? You know, honestly, I was really passionate. To, I've always been passionate about food. Like if you look at the background of my family um, sort of, uh, farmers, gardeners that migrated in the 60s from the south to um, just outside of Chicago. I grew up around urban gardening every single year. I was just gardening with my grandmother a few days ago. My dad's mother is um, a well-known yogi and activist um, in, in natural and uh, plant-based foods. Uh, so I've got a lot of inspiration from my family of entrepreneurs and, and just, you know, food heads. Uh, but also early on, my mom instilled in me just like this interest in science and research. Uh, and so I came, I came through it through a health lens. Honestly, when I was going into grad school, I was thinking that I was going to do more research on community based health practices and um, finding ways to use entrepreneurship to influence community health. Um, and I kept finding that there was uh, just an underlying theme of um, food access, food uptake, which is probably, um, you know, we talk about this, the statistics of death when it comes to hunger across the world. Um, many more people, billions of people are suffering from, from malnutrition when it comes to uh, poor diet and health, you know, chronic disease, 80% of chronic disease across the world is related to poor foods. Uh, it doesn't help that a lot of environmental degradation from factory farming, especially factory meat farming, uh, it affects us in other ways as well. Um, and it's not just like a, a race or, or a socioeconomic thing. It's literally uh, the foods that we eat. Uh, and some of the biggest food companies in the world, Nestle recently, uh, the biggest food company in the world said that 60% of their foods are unhealthy. And these are, this affects every single one of us. Um, and so when we think about community health, you cannot talk about it without um, thinking of the, our, our food uptake using technology and science uh, with that background, applying it to the food industry, what do you kind of see as the, the future? Are you particularly like focused on more of the, the small startups be able to, to come in and building these products or is it the larger companies that are going to come in and use this and, and make the change? Where's the balance and how do you see this, this happening? Uh, well, today they're both our customers. Um, while we are focused a little bit more on, on larger and fast growing uh, companies, uh, we are implementing some more automations that help with uh, just the undertaking of small startups when it comes to this, because this is a really slow process for them as well. Um, it's, it's slow for everyone. It's, it's quite complex. Uh, but for us, it's, you know, we just have a big goal of how we can help thousands of companies reformulate and manage millions of product lines better to feed uh, Two billion eaters um, to improve the the outcome of two billion eaters in the next five years. That's sort of our 
nearish term goal. Like and, um, you know, for us, it's like, how can we collect them out of the right data and continue to uh, expand on our, our customer distribution in the way that makes most sense. And so, you know, we will uh, be launching new products that really help accelerate, uh, you know, not only our customer acquisition, but our um, accelerate our goal uh, of, of those product lines. Um, you know, I think with the first part of that question, when we discuss what's the future of food, I think honestly, what's most exciting is that food has become so, I mean, of course, it's something that we eat <laughs> three times a day, but it's become so mainstream in interest um, from food culture to uh, food technology. And so what's great is that we're getting um some of the world's top scientists that want to work in food, right, and not work in sort of government funded labs with so projects that like don't have fast commercialization. Uh, and so talent is really great now in, in food and food tech. And I, I can see this every year with my, my team improving in the types of applications that we get. And so that's exciting. I think we'll be able to accelerate a lot of change and especially the sustainability impact of food over the next five to 10 years um, by a lot, uh, especially when we think about the growth of flexitarians across the world. Uh, and, and that's really just folks that used to say they're like hardcore carnivores and now are very interested in, you know, plant-based alternatives as they taste. I hadn't heard that better. phrase before. What did you call it? Uh, flexitarian? Flexitarians, yes. <laughs> okay. That's basically, you, you eat both? Is that what it is? Or? Yeah. So it's, it's you know, you have sort of the standard, um, like, American diet, but they're seeing, like, replacing a few meals a week or a few meals a month with more plant-based options because um, it feels lighter because you, you're you thinking you're making less impact on the world when, and also people are one of, uh, and, and this is gonna come become more and more apparent and, and uh, more, more consumers are gonna pay attention to this, but um, especially post COVID, we have a lot more impact of, um, or at least understanding of how uh, things like antibiotics affect our health and, and people are gonna be paying a lot more attention to that. Uh, and a lot of the antibiotic resistance in most of the human population is related to uh, the antibiotics in meats that we consume. And so as that research becomes more broadly available and digestible, you'll see more people that are switching over, not just because it's better to eat these foods to um, curb the, the risk of chronic disease or to impact the environment, but also because we want our antibiotics to work uh, so these are three huge reasons that uh, you'll see a lot more consumers going flexitarian in the next few years. And that gives a, a great sort of pathway into recruiting awesome talent, getting the right investments, getting the right public private partnerships and, and really accelerating uh, industry transition. I Coming back to your vision, your five-year vision to help 2 billion people over the next five years um, to be able to eat healthier. And this, this future, you see also flexitarians. I, I, I'm, what's so funny is the way you phrased it. My wife and I had just had a similar conversation like, well, you know what? I guess we could eat more plant. We, we do love meat. So it's, this is, this, it, I think it's in each of our minds. We're thinking about it more. It's a growing trend. So it sounds like you, you love this movie. You see the movement happening and you're wanting to help it. You're wanting to grow it by, by creating the right technology, like pl platforms that food scientists and CBG companies and other portfolios can create the right products that are feeding us better. Am, am I captivating this, this correctly? Yeah, you're, you're, you're captivating, you're captivating me in reverse and also capturing this, right. But, you know, um, you know, for us, it's like what types of data can we, so, so when we count that number 2 billion, it's like, how did we, how were we a part of the process from farm to, to table? And so like, if we work with a company that feeds 100,000 people every year and we're part of the, the process of that skew, um, then that's sort of how we count, to, uh, count that as like a co-manufacturer in a way, uh, right? With our, with our journey AI. And uh, we, we, we definitely believe that we can achieve that with some of our current customers and ones that will be coming on. Uh, I think, you know, the way we look at it is if like we can, if we can find like three major metrics 
for the like what the better is, you know, with these two billion eaters. And the metric that's this, the metrics that we're looking at are overall cost savings for these food companies and how they dial down to to customers, to their consumers, um, the overall impact in water use and greenhouse gas emissions in the foods that we eat, and the overall impact in nutrient density uh, as well, um, and, and, and sort of the, the transition into cleaner ingredients. Those those three components. One, I like how you started with with the money. I mean, the business is, <laughs> hey, let's reduce costs. I want that, but it doesn't mean it needs to be at the expense of um, the environment or the nutrition of what's actually being ingested and put into our bodies. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's just that we've uh, time is money, and money is transitioned into a very big impact with our our health and how food affects that, and so. Uh, we have to make sure that we're thinking about that, um, you know, holistically in this approach. And, you know, oftentimes those two areas within, especially larger food companies are very siloed, you know, like the CFO and the chief R&D officer, chief innovation officers, they're not really working together in ways um, with a, with an aligned mission. And uh, we want to build software that can empower those teams uh, collaboratively. Sure. Looking ahead from here, you've set your vision for five years, but I'm curious what what predictions you would make technology wise in the food industry. What do you think we'll see in five, 10 years from now um, when it comes to to technology and the use for food? You know, I I think um, there's going to be a lot of innovation in cell based uh, meats and seafoods. So taking it away from the farm and, um, you know, I have yet to try it. I think I'll try some later this year, but some good innovation on cell-based chicken, steak and um, and shrimp. And so what's going to be interesting are sort of these um, manufacturing kits, if you will, that um, can allow you to create cell-based meats like in your home. But we'll see where that goes, but definitely we'll be able to make them in smaller offices. (laughs) Is this the way this literally just creating meats from from nothing right so yeah you'll get a small uh, kit uh of of uh, you know sales based on the the meat that you choose and you get the full the full hardware and software stack to be able to uh use go from petri dish to something that you can put on a grill wow uh uh-huh, so that's a very exciting innovation uh i think you know What's interesting is you see consumer bases like in Singapore that um, are a lot more open to it. So we'll see how open consumers are to that because there have been some drives that have failed slightly or they were just delayed like um, uh, North American interest in in, uh, insect proteins and other things. Um, But I still think that that could be hot later in the twenties. You'll also see uh, on the food innovation side a lot more um, alternatives or, or like byproducts used in ingredients and 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 uh, you know all of the more popular products that we bring to our grocery stores. So, for example, using like waste from beer products and turning them into milks and to flowers and things. Uh, you'll see different forms of fermentation take place for flavors and and proteins. Uh, so really using uh, either traditional cultural practices to make new foods and uh, making sure that we're inclusive of the stories and history of those items, or also using a lot of food waste upcycled ingredients uh, that we were traditionally sending to landfills or feeding to um, meat farms and turning them into alternative products that are natural. What do you think it'll take for uh our culture, uh, particularly the Western culture uh, as individuals, as well as the companies to, to really want to move in this direction uh, overall? You know, there are some leaders in the industry that are taking, taking the initiative uh, and they don't want to be left behind. Food is really complex now. It's really competitive, especially with Amazon and, and Shopify and, and more decentralized uh, logistics chains. Uh, So you'll see companies needing to take a step up when it comes to nutrition and and sustainability. 
Um, and then if you compare those all with affordability, then you, you have a winner, right? So the companies that are making the strides to up their game today are definitely going to be winners over the next few years. The companies that are not scared of embracing change. So uh, digitizing faster, you know, that may mean just like many other industries that um, using artificial intelligence may impact, you know, some jobs, but overall it may uh, shift them to more managerial roles or have uh, for maybe a better impact on cost or uh, your consumer's interest. Uh, so embracing a little bit of uh, the impact that's going to happen across the board globally with, with, with digitalization and AI. But um, I, I think I think we're ready and, and there are a lot of consumers that are smarter than ever. And there's a lot of tools, you know, social media and documentaries that are helping accelerate that as well. So I'm, I'm pretty optimistic and, you know, obviously you can't change things without the optimism or, or some of that creativity. So uh, I, hope, I hope to continue to recruit, recruit great teammates and continue building. This you guys have been around for four four years, right? Uh, three uh, years. Three three years now. Yeah. Three years now. Um, and and it's like you you you're bringing all the pieces together. There's so much opportunity as as the growth going this direction. And and how big is the team now? Uh, we're 16. We should be 24 by the end of the year. We're growing quite quite rapidly, yeah, and a lot good. of folks are moving down to Austin as well. Um, okay. So have a great fun team down here. We'll. we'll uh, be going back to the office more in the coming months but uh no it's it's a great team and we we also have investors from three different continents and um Mm -hmm. you know most of our team is from north america mostly canada and and the u.s Uh, but we definitely have team members that are growing from uh, asia west africa europe and um you know hopefully we'll get some some more south south, i'm sorry south american our uh, growth in, in the coming months into next year. Uh, you guys but, yeah. Serving um, uh, also the companies and those who are building these products globally as well. Absolutely. You know, so like finding ways to, and, you know, on a, a lot of these companies um, that are based in the U S or based in Asia, they have global arms uh, in many, in many continents. So uh, we, we know that like, we may start with one division of a company and and then uh, we'll do some hyperlocal translation services and mapping some of the local supply chains there. But um, in regulatory uh, needs and retailer needs uh, in, in some of these countries, but we have uh, more of a toolkit and game plan now for spinning up to new regions. And um, so we absolutely see that. On the, I know you, you, you're, mainly focus at the moment on some of the larger brands that have the portfolio and need this type of, of vast data that, and, and platform mm-hmm. to use it. But you're wanting to eventually open up for, for more startups, uh, foodies that want to build new products. Yeah, I mean, we, we have startups now. Uh, it, it's just more of a curated process. We, we will be opening up by the end of the year for a lot more startups. But for now, it's, it's sort of, um, you know, we have monthly selections. Gotcha. For, for those folks, because it's funny, I I feel like there, there's more and more opportunity for even for consumers to want to buy things from from new startups every day. My wife just saw on Instagram and bought this energy bar uh, that was like had a green tea in it. It's like she bought it just right from Instagram and then we grabbed it. Any advice that you would give to to a new food startup that is trying to reinvent uh, the way it it has been done and you would just give any advice to to one of these startups? Yeah, reach out to us, um, <laughs> journeyfoods.io. Uh, but, but honestly, uh, think bold and um, you know really try to dive into uh, your differentiating factor and and really study so the supply chain. Like um, today, it's easier than ever to launch an e-commerce company, to launch you know a startup. Uh, more and more folks are getting excited about CPG and many regions across the world and some of the biggest opportunities are like mastering your own supply chain um, and not running into bottlenecks but also continually diving into your differentiating factor that's going to make your customers happy awesome thank you so much Rihanna, for sharing the journey that you've been on the honestly the, 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 the big shift that's happening in the world and where we are headed your vision for five years from now and for those that can 
be able to join and, and use your platform. Those that like to learn more, you can head over to journeyfoods.io and you can be able to explore and, and start. I like actually the, the button on your website is start your journey. I think yeah, that right there. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time, Rihanna. All right. All right. Thank this you. Absolutely. And we'll see you all on the next episode of Uptech Report. Have you seen a company using AI, machine learning, or other technology to transform the way we live, work, and do business? Go to uptechreport.com and let us know.